Hey, guess what? It's time for voiceover body shop. And our guest this week is the one and only Fred Melamed. Fred, how you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Pleasure to see you both and everybody out there. Yeah, we're going to have a great time talking to you about all sorts of cool stuff when when it has to do with acting and voice acting and what you got to do. If you've got a question for Fred Melamed, you can put it in the Facebook chat room. And I know Jeff Holman is sitting in there anxiously awaiting with a quill and pen to uh, write those down and pass those questions on to us so we can talk to uh, ask those of Fred a little bit later on. And uh, George, you all set to roll? I'm ready. I got my daughter right here asking for a password and I'm ready to go. All right, it's time for VoiceOver Body Shop right now. From the outer reaches, they came. Bearing the knowledge of what it takes to properly record your voiceover audio. And together, from the center of the VO universe, they bring it to you now. George Widom, the engineer to the VO stars, a Virginia Tech grad with the skills to build, set up, and maintain the professional VO studios of the biggest names in VO today. And you, Dan Leonard, the voiceover home studio master, a professional voice talent with the knowledge and experience to help you create a professional sounding home VO studio. And each week, they allow you into their world, bringing you talks with the biggest names in the voiceover world today, letting you ask your questions, and giving you the latest information to make the most of your voiceover business. Welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop. VoiceOver Body Shop is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, Remote Studio Connections for Everyone, VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website isn't a pain in the butt. VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training. JMC Demos, when quality matters. And VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live to drive, from their super secret clubhouse and studio in Sherman Oaks, California. Here are the guys. Well, hello there. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. B-S. B-S. Phantom voice in there. Anyway, uh, we're here to talk about the voiceover business, and uh, we've got a great guest coming up in just a couple minutes. Fred Melamed will be joining us. And, uh, you know, it's interesting when you get up in the morning here in Southern California and you put on the radio and they start talking about this brutal weather back east. And I turn to, to Mrs. Leonard. And I'm like, do I have to go shovel the driveway? Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> it's just a fever dream, Dan. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I I miss the Northeast not. Mm-hmm. I miss my friends. I, there are certain things I miss about it, but you know, after almost five and a half years here in Southern California, I'm well, there's room for you. Come on out. Cause you know, like all these big CEOs are leaving, like you could move into say Elon Musk's place. Oh yeah. God, could didn't, you he move to, didn't he move to, didn't he move to Texas? <laughs> yeah. Something like that. <laughs> Hey, look, we got a great guest tonight. Let's bring him on so we can present the important stuff that he's got to get. Now, here's a guy that's been on a lot of TV shows, a lot of great movies. Maybe you saw The Serious Man or In a World or some of some great Coen Brothers movies. You know, I keep you keep popping up everywhere. Let's welcome Fred Melamed. Fred, how you doing? I'm doing good, thank you. I'm delighted to see you both, see both Dan and George and everybody who's who's watching. Yeah, we're uh, you know I, I see you everywhere, you know, because we, we're sitting around binge watching everything. I mean, it got so bad we started watching, you know, Turkish soap operas, but it was, <laughs> <laughs> that were not dubbed. So go figure that one. Uh, I, you were not in those, but you've been in almost everything else. I, you know, we saw you in, in WandaVision uh, early on this season. And uh, are, are you going to be doing more appearances in that one? Or is that just... In WandaVision? Like, I'm sworn to secrecy about almost uh, everything to do with, with WandaVision. So uh, I can't okay. say much about it. Uh, Other okay. than uh, uh, I hope people enjoy it. I'm, I'm happy to talk about it, but I'm not, not permitted to talk in depth about it, uh, certain aspects of it, things that happen in the future. Ah, uh, 
well, you don't have no idea what time anything is going on with that show anyway. So it's well, there's a new episode every Friday. That's uh, that show is <laughs> that's all we know. Serially revealed. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people are liking it. It's pretty good. Uh, and and we were talking earlier this week that I finally watched a serious man, and you were going to tell me that you know you didn't understand the ending either. I mean, I'm like, what? Well, I mean, it's well, <laughs> I I I can't say that I I mean. <sighs> That's a, it's a work of art, so I wouldn't presume to uh, say that I exactly know. It does sort of parallel the Bible. You know, there's a story in the Bible yeah. of somebody kind of similar to the story of Larry in that movie. And I know, what, I, I, I know what happens in the biblical story. Um, but I think, it's meant to, it, I think it's meant to confound you. I think it's meant to sort of make you go, that's what happened? You know, I think, that's, I think that is, uh, was the intent of the Coen brothers. Yeah, I, I think they 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 achieved that. So how how busy have you been during the pandemic? How are you? Uh, I mean, are, have you been working? What have you been doing? Well, uh, I've been doing voice stuff only. I haven't done any on camera stuff whatsoever. Uh, I'm at high risk uh, for the various uh, unpleasant or worse than unpleasant manifestations of COVID. So yeah. uh, uh, I I can't do anything that uh, exposes me to the risk of getting it. Uh, other than the smallest possible risk. So I'm staying at home. Um, I have been doing some work for, from home, uh, some animated shows. Uh, let's see, I have some things that I can mention to people. Um, I have uh, an animated um, show that some people may have heard of called The Harper House. Uh, I appear on that serially. I appear on several, several episodes of that. I also appear on Ephes for Family. Oh, which is a, it's last uh, going to start later this year. It's the last season, really amusing, interesting show that uh, I think many people know. Uh, some of your previous guests and friends, mutual friends of ours, Debbie Derryberry, among others, appear on that show. Yeah. Um, uh, and then I have a bunch of stuff coming out that was shot before the pandemic. Um, I have a movie called Marzipan, kind of interesting movie about an alcoholic kind of dried up, uh, woman who works for the CIA who was given one really big last uh, assignment and I play her handler in that movie. Um, that'll be out later this year. Um, I have another movie coming out uh, probably not for a year or more called Hug Chicken Penny, which is a sort of Dickensian movie uh, with a guy that I've collaborated with a bunch of times called S. Craig Zoller, wonderful, interesting uh, actor, I mean, writer, director. Um, another film I have that was a big hit at Sundance called Together Together, which will be probably either on cable or a streamer, I would imagine by this summer. Um, really sort of charming, interesting movie uh, in which I play Ed Helms's dad. Um, and in that movie, Ed Helms plays a guy who is single and wants to adopt a child uh, and then decides he wants to do it via surrogacy. So he finds a woman to be a surrogate with whom he doesn't really have any relationship at all. And it's about what happens between them. Also very sort of interesting um, movie. Um, another one I have coming out, also a big hit at Toronto called um, Shiva Baby, which is about a young woman who supplements her income while she's a student uh, by, being a, a, by having a sugar daddy who pays her for sexual encounters. Um, and then she's a, she happens to be Jewish, and she's invited to go to a shiva, which is a Jewish funeral service with her family, to somebody that she doesn't know very well, but they're constantly going to these shivas. And there she sees her sugar daddy, this guy, who happens to have been uh, good, uh, his family, good friends with the, the family of the person who passed away. And they find out that they are, their families know each other, and it becomes extremely excruciating for this poor girl. I'm sure, yeah. Wow. Well, you were, you were very busy then. And no wonder I'm seeing you just about everywhere. Yeah, but, and, there's, and there's a bunch of stuff also just still on that, uh, that I've done in the last year, year and a half. Uh, Superstore, which is a, a CBS series, Medical Police, which is on Netflix. Uh, the Morning Show, which is on Apple TV. Uh, yeah, another yeah. movie that I have coming out, a kind of Jewish exorcist, a Jewish horror film called The Vigil. Uh, just won a very big, uh, also a very big award. So I have, I have, I have plenty of stuff um, that's that's in the rotation. I have another film on HBO now called Lying and Stealing, in which I play a, a really villainous, uh, unusually villainous um, character with no uh, comic apologetic um, posture, just a pure, downright nasty villain, which is a lot of fun for me to play. So that's that, and that's a movie I would, uh, I think people might enjoy. 
great. Well, now, now I got all this stuff. I gotta, I gotta go check out when it happens. So you, you've been, I mean, you've been acting for a long time. I mean, I mean, you, you were, as is true with a lot of great actors, you went to a really good school. You're Yale graduate. Yale drama school, which is a, a yeah. graduate school. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, all the great actors all have gone to these really good schools. And, I disagree. I disagree. Uh, well, I'm sure there's some really good actors who went to some really crappy schools, but certainly ones that go to the good schools tend to be, you, you see that in their resume. But uh, we'll take it be a step beyond that uh, because trying to be good at something is, you know, everybody wants to be the best or the greatest or whatever. When you try to get into acting, is that really the attitude you should have? And what does it really take to move you in that direction? Well, that, uh, in my view, is an excellent question. Well, thank you. Um, and an important question. And in my view, the answer to that question is yes, it is worth it to try and be great at something, at anything, in fact. Um, you know, I have a, I have a somewhat different take on voice acting than probably, um, many other people, um, that people talk to, especially people that are just trying to get into it. Uh, because I think people very often get lost asking questions that are not really the most vital questions. They want to know answers to things like, um, is it, should I get the road mic that's 250 or is it worth it to spend a thousand dollars to get the AKG what's mic? What's the best or, microphone for voiceover? George and I. What's the best, what's the best microphone for voiceover that's doesn't, that won't take, a week, to, yeah. take out a, you know, a second yeah. mortgage or, uh, how can I get an agent that's a really good agent to represent me? Is it worth it to get a good agent? Should I have more than one agent? Um, is it, should I go on P to P sites? What about my website? Who should I have design my website? Um, all these questions, which are of very, very minor importance. What really matters is, um, do I want to be good at this? And if so, how do I get good at it? How do I get good at this? And what is good at this? You know, to me, the idea of being a working voiceover actor, a working actor, um, is too modest by far a goal. Uh, I wouldn't want to be a working dentist, teacher, bricklayer. Um, I'd want to be great at any one of those things because otherwise why do it to make a living? I guarantee you. I mean, I think people get the, get the idea that, you know, well, it's great. I'll be a voice actor. I won't have a, I won't have a boss. I can wear pajamas, all these stuff. It's a lot of, it's much too much work. <laughs> if that's the goal, just be able to make a living, um, you know, a modest living and, and not have to have a, have a boss. I'd choose something that was much easier. Um, if you're really successful at it, and if you're really good at it, the rewards are great. They're great. I mean, um, I, I've had a, I've been uh, extremely, extremely fortunate um, in that uh, I've been doing it for a long time, and also I came to prominence in it when it was a much smaller coterie of people that were doing it than are doing it today. And the work was more concentrated and it was all union work. And because of that, uh, I don't have to worry about working. I can take a job if I want to and not, I don't have to work anymore as long as I live. That's extreme. That's, that's the definition of extremely lucky, extremely fortunate. Yeah. Um, but my point in saying that is, um, I also wanted to be good at it. So how do you do that? Well, I think the answer to that, and my, by, by the way, my perspective also may be different because I'm one of the relatively few people that will come on this show that doesn't have anything whatsoever to sell. <laughs> <laughs> I don't teach anything. The joy of this show is shameless promotion. Yeah. <laughs> I don't teach. I don't give lessons. I don't make tapes. I don't coach anybody. I don't have uh, round robins. I don't do any of that stuff. Um, so I value education and I value study, but it's also my opinion that this enormous cottage industry that exists, this side industry of, of training people and making tapes and all that kind of stuff, um, which has grown larger than the voiceover business itself, um, is 
is in many instances uh, not servicing the people that uh, it claims to service properly. Um, so I don't have any of that, you know, as a as a as a as an influence in my in my my ideas about it. So okay, you want to be good at voiceovers. Um, what does good mean? What does good actually mean? Well, you could use an external measure and say good means people are hiring me. That certainly a, seems like a reasonable one reasonable measure. But how do you become good by your own lights, by your own standards, to your own ear? Well, how would you get good at anything else? How would you get good at playing the piano or learning, I don't know, Spanish or being a writer or almost anything that that's a skill that's also a talent? I mean, there's both things involved. Well, the first thing I would do is I would listen to people that I thought were really good. I would really, and if you don't know who's really good, then that's where to start. Listen to a lot of different people, tapes, reels, even people on TV and you know elsewhere, movies, wherever you listen, and think who you really, who really moves you. I mean, after all, what's good is what compels you, right? If a voice somehow makes you listen to it, we live in a wash in a sea of information, as everybody knows. There's constantly voices, advertising, programming, programs trying to get our attention. Certain people get our attention, but they don't get it by saying, hey, look at me. Or if they do, it, our attention doesn't last long. So there has to be something about what that person, you know, should, is, it, is it because they could do things clearly, understandably? Is it because they can do things... I mean, I th that seems like a very, very common ability to be able to do things clearly, understandably. You have to be able to do things in a way that cuts through the wash of stuff that we are bathed in and actually makes an impression. You go, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, the meats. I want to get one of those Arby's. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> or whatever it is. It usually works I'm, for me, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't even like Arby's, but I noticed, I noticed Ving Rhames on that ad, right? Um, uh, so at some level, whatever you do has to, uh, affect the person listening to it at some visceral level. That's what it has to do. It has to make him associate what you're doing. If it's advertising with something that he wants to possess, or if it's something that's being acted with a feeling that you're trying to impart to a scene or to a character. Hmm. So that's, that's. I think the answer is um, to the question that you asked is it's worth it to try and actually be great at something. And um, it's important to, um, I'm not, I don't think that it's not important to make decisions about, you know, how does my website look or, you know, that kind of stuff. But that's about that. All that stuff together is maybe eight or 9% and the other 91% people don't worry about. And that's where they should be worried. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would, I would, I totally agree with that. I know when I'm talking to people, when I'm, you know, when I'm working with clients and helping them with their home studios and stuff, and it's like, you know, you, you, you want to be better than everybody else, be better than them, you know, in what your craft is. Uh, you know, it's like, well, she, exactly what you were saying, you know, should I get a better website? Oh, I got to get this mic. I've got to get this. I've got to get, look, it doesn't really matter so much you know, te technologically, I mean, that's what George and I do. I mean, we, we, we talk with people all the time about here's how it's supposed to sound, but in the long run, you know, how do you stand out amongst all these other people, this huge tsunami of people coming into voiceover and, and, and into acting. And since acting sort of shut down, everybody, all them coming into voiceover, uh, how is it that, you know, how do you stand out? You just got to be better. So, uh, if you're just joining us, by the way, our guest is Fred Melamed, and we're talking about what it really takes to be successful. If you have a question for Fred about, you know, his career or what he's talking about, about really what you need to do to improve your, your acting and voice acting chops, put it in the Facebook chat room. And I know Jeff Holman is in there furiously writing these things down and uh, we'll get to those in just a little bit. 
So what do you do as, as an accomplished actor? Uh, how do you keep yourself? How do you keep acting fit? I mean, do you, do you still take classes? Are you still working with coaches, that sort of thing? No, I do not. Okay. All right. I do not. You're working a lot, so that helps. Well, I mean, here's the thing. When it, you know, when it comes to voice acting, I think there's great value in, in uh, practicing, and there's value in practicing in front of people or having, you know, listen, listening to people, but also listening to yourself. I think as you get better at voice acting, you know, when you when you first start listening to yourself, there's this kind of shock thing that happens. You go, Jesus, I sound like that. And as you do it more and more, the kind of difference between what you hear in your head and what the microphone actually hears uh, lessens. The, that gap is made up somewhere in your brain and your consciousness. Yeah. Um, so you have that that issue. Then you have another issue, which is how does what you're doing fit into the overall thing? You know, how, how does it how does it cut into um, whatever it's being used for, the, whatever way it's being used, then you have to listen to that. Uh, listen to it in the context in which it's intended. So I think it's worth it to really practice and listen to yourself. Now, wh what I do is I think of things subtextually. So people who are not familiar with acting um, expressions may not know the expression subtext. In, in modern acting theory, and by modern I mean like 120 years old, um, um, there's a concept about acting, which is that there's a text, which is the words that we say that the playwright or the copywriter or whoever it is has written for us. And then there's whatever is beneath the words. Now, there's a character. There's always a character. The character in, if you see a film, the character is very obvious that it's not, that, that, that it's somebody different than the actor. Oh, sometimes it's very obvious. Not always. Sometimes it's very obvious. Other times it's not. The way I think of a character is that a character is always me. It's always me, but it's me wearing a coat. And the coat can be extremely different from me. In other words, the coat may consist of an English accent. It may be a person whose orientation towards women is entirely different than mine, whose orientation towards work is entirely different than mine, who has to scrounge money to come up with enough for dinner. So that's all the coat. And the coat can make me, ex can be extremely different, as I say, and it can be almost anybody. But it's me underneath because I must react realistically to whatever the situation is that I am faced with, whatever I'm presented with. Now, sometimes it's a one-way conversation because I have copy to perform and that's all. I'm not conversing with anybody in the sense that we normally think of it. But still, I think of myself as having a message to impart to the listener. I'll give you an example. There, there was a commercial on TV a while ago for a um, an ice cream, Dove Bars. You know those Dove Bars ice cream? Oh, mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Very, very, very high butterfat, delicious, rich Now ice cream. I yeah. want one. Thank I you very much. I don't eat anymore. But uh, very nice ice creams. So the whole commercial was they showed this bar of ice cream getting somebody holding it out and it was getting chocolate, molten, melting, delicious looking, rich chocolate dr kind of dribbling all over this ice cream bar. And that was the whole visual and the voiceover, which was Kathleen Turner, you know, Kathleen Turner, the actress. Oh, now, now I remember this commercial. Yeah, yeah this is years ago. But it stuck out in my mind. And and I I can't remember what the copy was. It was a very simple copy. Something about Dove Bars. And, you know, uh, the point was, when you watched this, you knew that whatever else was going on in your life, however else your marriage was failing or <laughs> you didn't have money to pay your mortgage, the 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 five minutes or two minutes, if you're me, that would take you to eat a Dove Bar for that amount of time, all would be right with the world. In other words, the experience of this Dove Bar was was Calgon take me away was an, was 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 uh, profound enough, deep enough that all the other things in life that are semi satisfying, not quite living up to your expectations, don't matter. 
when you saw this commercial and heard Kathleen Turner do this voiceover, that was the that was you knew that that's what that's what the message was. So that's an example of subtext, right? Now, sometimes subtexts are are very obvious, and they use certain things to associate uh, clearly. For example, car commercials, right? High end car commercials. Um, they use things like luxury, sensual pleasure, often kind of sexy suggestions that, you know, if you have this car, a car is a reflection of who you are. That's the, that's the sort of basic concept in car advertising. You don't want to drive a Nova. They don't make Novas anymore, but whatever the, whatever a Yugo, whatever the, whatever the today's Yugo is or Nova is, because that's you you're driving around, right? So if you're, you know, I don't know if you're a Porsche kind of a guy, or if you're a, a, uh, I don't know how you, you know, you can see yourself any one of a number of ways. Uh, maybe a Porsche. Maybe uh, you see yourself more as a, um, a cool-looking family van, <laughs> a Tacoma. Yeah, I don't know. Thing, yeah. Yeah, but the <laughs> idea is that you, that car is a representation of you in the automotive world. So that's the way we're going to sell you the car. You know that, 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 that this is an extension of you, so you deserve this. You deserve this. That's a subtextual message, right? So if I'm reading, or, or another message is, um, let's say I have, for example, I have a Tesla, right? So Teslas are cool. They're cool because they they are genuinely a new technology, which is a great technology, and they're also a really good, cool car to drive, fun car to drive. Um, Elon Musk had a very, very clever, smart idea which was to introduce not the Model T first, not the, not the three that everybody can afford. He introduced the super expensive one first, that's very luxurious, that's built to last forever. And that when people saw them on the street, they go, yeah, that's a car I want. I want one of those. Yeah. Right, exactly. So he created with, with that car, this, um, this image. So when I approach voiceover, it's with a subtextual message. Now it can be anything, and it can have it cannot relate to the text at all. Um, there are some instances, like for example, uh, see the USA and your Chevrolet. Oh, that's a, that's a, nobody's old enough to remember what that means, but that 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 used to be a that used to be a uh, the tagline for Chevrolet automobiles. I'm trying to think of something that's a really memorable uh, modern uh, tag. We've gotten so far away from things that are memorable. Well, yeah. Arby's, we have the meats, for example, one we, we mentioned a short while ago. Um, so what is the subtext that Ving Rhames, the great Ving Rhames, that uh, wonderful actor who is the guy who voices that commercial, those commercials? Um, well, he certainly, uh, he certainly grabs our attention. But if I were doing that commercial, what would I use as a, as a subtext? Well, I'm just guessing. I'm just trying to come up with something. I think maybe something like, um, this is a meal that you're going to have that you will be thinking about next week and next week and next week. And when you come to work, you're going to be thinking about lunch all day. It doesn't say that anywhere in the, in the text. I'm just thinking that. Mm -hmm. And with the words, the few words that I have to say, which are, Arby's, we have the meats. I'm going to be saying in my mind and trying to get you to feel, it doesn't matter if you get to work at 7.30, you're still going to be thinking all day about the time you can open this Arby's at 12.30 when you have your lunch. That's a subtext. Huh. It might work. It might not. <laughs> <laughs> you can always try a different one. Yeah, yeah. You've watched enough Super Bowl commercials. You're like, eh, I don't think they nailed that one uh, quite the way they should have. But, and then sometimes they do. Yeah, yeah. Once again, we're talking with Fred Melamed uh, about voice acting and subtext and those sorts of things. Again, if you've got a question, throw it in the chat room. Uh, we're going to take a quick break right now, and uh, we'll be back with your questions and uh, find out what Fred uses in his studio right after these messages. Well, hello there. I bet you weren't expecting to hear some big-voiced announcer guy on your new orientation training for Snapchat, were you? Stick around. You don't want to miss this. Power 103.9. At Target, we want you to come as you are. Be comfortable. 
Okay, maybe not bathrobe comfortable. Pants for the customer in aisle four, please. Nuevo México necesita un cambio. La representante Michelle Lujan Grisham ha luchado por nuestro estado en la Cámara de Representantes. Watch anywhere, anytime on an unlimited number of devices. Sign in with your Netflix account to watch instantly at Netflix.com. The ice cream maker is a big risk that can have huge rewards until you forget to turn it on. Well, that's it, guys. Time is up. Hey, it's JMC. Thanks for watching the voiceover body shop. If you're demo ready or looking to get there, check out jmcdemos.com and see a sample of our work. Now let's get back to Dan and George and this week's tech wisdom. Hey there, it's David H. Lawrence, the 17th with VO Heroes. And you may be watching voiceover body shop, V-O-B-S, because you're interested in becoming a voice talent. And you looked around the internet, you found that this was a great place to come and you're absolutely right. Um, but you don't have any of the knowledge yet as to how to get started. And I'd like to help you with that. I've got a free course online. You can take it anytime you want. It's called Getting Started in VoiceOver. And it walks you through the equipment you need, the business side of things, the actual categories of voiceover work that you'll likely be pursuing, and also the mindset that you need to have when you're getting started and moving into being successful at doing voiceover for a career. So if you're an actor or you're not an actor, you want a side grade from another business, you want to learn about voiceover, go to voheroes.com slash start. That's voheroes.com slash start for the VO Heroes Getting Started in VoiceOver class. And I'll see you there. So I was talking to Harlan Hogan this morning. He described Chicago as having permafrost, with more snow on the way. But something warmed his heart. A letter from a satisfied VoiceOver Essentials customer. And here's what he said. Hi, Harlan. Getting started in the VoiceOver business and want a big value for your dollar? Look no further than Harlan's Portabooth Pro and the VO1A mic. These got me started and have proven valuable in producing over 50 titles on Audible. Great results for a great price right out of the box. Douglas Burke, the agile narrator. So if you do audiobooks, clearly these two products from VoiceOverEssentials.com can help you get it done. Go on over to VoiceOverEssentials.com to see all the great voiceover recording equipment and accessories you'll ever need. That's VoiceOverEssentials.com, the home of Harlan Hogan's signature series products like the VO1A mic and the Porter Booth Pro and Plus. Thanks, Harlan. Hi, this is Bill Farmer, and you are watching VoiceOver Body Shop. It's great. And we're back with Fred Melamed. We're talking about uh, voice acting and, and really what it takes. Let me ask you. you now, I can see you've got a microphone in front of you. And I do. <laughs> what, do you, what do you have in your home studio? Uh, well, I have two microphones that I alternate back and forth with. This is a Neumann U87i microphone. Um, I'll tell you the reason I have this microphone. Um, when I started, first of all, I was the second person that I knew of all the people that I knew in the voiceover business to have a home studio. I built my home studio in 1992. Whoa. So what is really that? 20, 29 years ago? Yeah, <laughs> almost or, almost we'll call it 30 years ago. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're about so, and as the technology changed, of course I had, and when I, when I built my home studio, this, I, I didn't live in California. Then I lived in New York city. And, um, the only way to go live, uh, to do, um, uh, live recording to hook up with another studio, which was w a now very old technology called Switch 56, um, oh which gosh. was b before yeah. ISDN. Yeah. Uh, um, a very, by our standards, primitive system, but it worked, you know, it worked fine. But the, the, it wasn't made for consumer use. It was made for recording studios and it was expensive and big and hot and it had to have fans in it and stuff like that. So anyway, what I did, I lived in an apartment in New York and I had a big walk-in closet, quite a good roomy walk-in closet. So I just took that walk-in closet and I put up Sonex all over it and I carpeted it and stuff like that. And then I had a, a thing custom built for my computer and my microphone and a mic stand and that sort of thing. Now, to give you an idea of how long ago this was, I required for my recording a 1.5 gigabyte hard drive, a 1.5 gigabyte hard drive that was rack mounted. Oh my that God. 1.5, which was, was the largest one that you could buy commercially at the time. Yeah. 
It cost twelve thousand dollars. Whoa, twelve thousand dollars for a one point five. You can go to um, Staples now and get something that's ten times that big. That's the size of your finger, and it's in the eighty-nine cent bin. No kidding. Seriously, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So this <laughs> this is all just to show you know how the, how radically things have changed. But I've had this mic, this Neumann U eighty seven, since then. Um, and, and the reason that I have this for mic, another thirty years, I hope so. I hope I'm still around when this mic is still. Yeah. Around. Um, the the reason that I got this mic was because at the time I had to match all the mics in the New York studios. That was the idea. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't because this mic is. I mean, it happens to be a very very good mic, uh, in my opinion. But the real reason was because I didn't want it to sound like I was different than any other studios that I was recording in. So at the time, this was the ubiquitous microphone for New York studios for voice recording. At the same time, interestingly, um, in, uh, here on the West Coast, California, um, this mic was not so much the uh, mic of choice. It had become because of, well, I, this, I think, I've think i heard this story. I, I think it's true. I don't know if it's entirely true. Um, largely because of Ernie Anderson. Oh, the 416. That's the legend, yes. 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 Um, another mic, which is a highly directional. This, is, this mic is a cardioid shape. Well, it has a capsule you can change on it. You can change what how you want it, but I usually use it in the cardioid shape. This is all boring, all this shit. I don't know. I'm just talking. That's what our show is. We talk about, about this all the time. <laughs> okay. So um, there was there's another mic um, uh, call, uh, called a, a 414 that is much more directional. And for my kind of voice, I have a kind of a deep voice. And in my view, I actually sound better on that mic than I think I do on this mic sometimes. Right. This mic is has a lot of low end on it, as, it, as, as you know, uh, and I think I need a little bit more emphasis on sharp. And of course, what well, this can be done without microphones, it can be done, you know, in 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 uh, with with, with um, various kinds of equalization. Right. But in terms of just raw sound, I kind of like the way I sound less. I think I like the way I sound better on the 414 than I do on this mic. Yeah, the Are you talking about the, yeah. the, the, the AKG 414 or the yes. shotgun mic? Oh, oh the 414. Oh, yeah, 414. No, I, I, what did I say? Four, four, yeah, I'm talking about the shotgun mic. The 416. Oh, the 416. Right, right, right. 416. I'm sorry. I said 414. No, there's but, also a 414. That's why. Well, yeah, that's an AKG shaped like yes. sort, of, sort of like a pyramid right. shaped mic. Yeah, 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 exactly. I meant the 416. I'm sorry. Yes, right, right. I think on that, that shotgun 416 mic, I sound a little better. Mm -hmm. That is a, is a, is it was meant originally for doing film recording and it's a long mic if you've seen one with a small capsule at the end of it highly directional so if you use that you have to get used to really not moving much but i mm -hmm. think i sound better on that and certain people do the rumor is or i don't know the legend and you george says maybe it's true i don't know the legend is that the reason that mic became so ubiquitous in california was because um, this very well-known uh, voiceover artist of, I guess, the 70s? Yeah. Yeah, mid-70s. For ABC. He was the voice of ABC, which oh, had oh, Love Boats oh, and what else? I don't yeah. remember uh, all those years ago. Yeah. The guy called Ernie Anderson, the father of Paul Thomas Anderson, the notable, very notable, great director, um, who became paranoid or un, un, uncomfortable about people talking about him while he was in the booth. So he insisted on sitting, this is the, the legend, insisted on sitting with the producer in the part of the studio where the producer sits, uh, talking into this extremely directional mic. Now, that's what people say the truth is. I don't know if it's really true or not. Of course, also... Well do you know? Yeah, I mean, he wanted to be in there, but probably also it's just a lonely gig. I think because in those days, you know, all that announcing was truly live. Yeah. And so you were in that box for hours. And, uh, you know, so you can look at it a couple different ways. You know, there's the, the he didn't want people talking about him behind his back. Yeah. And there's also he the, had a bit of a reputation anyway. He so. didn't want to be alone. <laughs> but whatever the case, the 416 was the only mic that could reject all the background noise from all the machinery in that and it in does have a different room. a different sound it's a little more yeah. compressed sounding mm -hmm. it's a little more high endy i think you know it's the sales uh, mic yeah it's for selling stuff yeah um by the way when i first became friends with don lafontaine now i 
I don't know how many listeners know who Don LaFontaine was. I guess a lot, a good number of them. Know. <laughs> so when I first got to be friends with Don LaFontaine, he used to drive around from studio to studio in a white uh, stretch limo with said D La F on it, you know, on the door. And at the, this is before cell phones. But there was a thing called a ship to shore phone, which was a radio phone before cell phones. And they were very expensive and they didn't, they didn't work that great. But he had one in his limo. And what he used to do was he, when fax machines first came into being, he put a fax machine in his car and hooked it up to his ship to shore radio so that he could be faxed the scripts so that by the time he would get to wherever the studio, and you had to schlep all over in those days between the different studios. <laughs> so he spent half the day sitting in the car going from one studio to, to another. So rather than wasting the time just sitting there, you know, in the car, in the traffic, he would get advanced copies of the scripts faxed to him so that he would have know what they know what they said and I guess be up on them and practice them. So when he got into the studio, he could just sit down, do them, run through them and leave and go to the next place. So that I, was we, that we've was heard these stories many times. And I know They're George amazing. Knew, him, knew him personally and stuff. We got a lot of questions from our audience here. You ready to tackle some of these? Absolutely. All right. Uh, go for it, George. Top one there from Jeff. Well, the very one on the first one on the top is from Jeff Ganius. I am hoping that's the right way to say that name. Um, what is your? What are your top two or maybe even three acting books book recommendations? Do you have any that pop off the top of your head that you like? Yes, sure. Um, the I, I'd say my number one favorite. Um, let's see. Uh, is a book called Respect for Acting by Uta Hagen. That's a that's a book that's not difficult to understand. It explains things in a kind of a easy way, um, and uh, that would be my number one choice. Um, the second one is a is a kind of just very old fashioned but very good book called An Actor Prepares by Konstantin Stanislavski, the famous acting theoretician. And the third one, um, which really had a big effect on me personally. Um, is actually anything by a, a, a guy called Michael Chekhov, who had an interesting view of acting where he he said every character has what he called an essential gesture, which is a kind of a metaphoric way of looking at a character. In other words, to give you an example, um, I for the people that are familiar with the movie A Serious Man, um, I play a character in that, a kind of an odd character who's a villain but his style of villainy is um, strange and unctuous where he kind of makes people relax. And he has this very cool way of talking where he, he kind of calms everybody down. And my idea with this character was that he was a massager, this Cy Abelman character. He would massage people either with his voice or with his way of handling them. So everything he 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 does is essentially a massage. So this is this kind of Michael Chekhov idea of an essential gesture for every character. Yeah. Great <laughs> Those are my, my, my top picks. Yeah. Uh, Matt Zacco asks, uh, do you think being an on-camera actor makes you a better voice actor? And what do you like about each craft the most? Well, you know, they're, they're very different, although they use some of the same things. Um, I do think that being good as an on-camera actor can improve your voice acting and vice versa. I think learning either thing can help the other, but they're so different because in voice acting, you have no visual and therefore you have to put everything into your voice as I, as I think of it, as I look at it. I mean, you're always trying to communicate something with your voice. Whereas in on-camera acting, um, I almost never think about my voice at all. Um, I let it do what it does, but it's 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 um, it's always in the service of the character, as I think of it. So I never think of doing anything specific with my voice, other than what, other than trying to uh, to impart what the character is actually experiencing. Um, I think anything that narrows your focus improves your acting. 
both your voice acting. It's, it's a strange thing. You uh, narrowing your focus widens your mind. It's one of those strange paradoxes. Um, concentration is a big deal in acting. You have to be able to concentrate, you know, and when you're acting on camera, there's people holding lights near you and things go wrong and you have to remember places to stand and there's all these technical things. But in a sense, you have to kind of take that all into your consciousness and yet make it very, very narrow your consciousness as to what you're doing. So all these peripheral things don't uh, distract you. It's a concentration game. Uh, and I think that also applies to voice acting, but I think you have to, you have to, you know, you're going to constantly get direction. Like, you know, uh, that was great. It was 0.7 seconds. Uh, we want it to be 0.6 seconds, but have fun with it <laughs> or, or things like that, uh, wh where you have technical things to observe. And yet your mind can't be too, caught in the technical because you still have to make your point as an actor meaning meaning is first your meaning is first so you have to kind of balance both things both the technical aspects and also the human side of it that's the that's the skill part of it it's being able to balance those things and not get thrown off when they say to you well we needed 0.6 seconds faster and not have it sound we need the six six we need 0.6 seconds faster but we want it to sound slower <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've gotten that one. That's yeah, well, everybody's gotten that one. Everybody's gotten that. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, you have to sort of be able to still keep your thought pure and let in all these things, but keep your mind on the on the on your goal, so to speak. Okay. On the other half of the question was, what do I like better, or? Well, I, what do you like most about each? Well, what I love about acting in general, and I think especially about on-camera acting, is that it's so consuming to me that I can't think about anything else. <laughs> I like it for the same reason that I like gambling. Uh, it takes my entire consciousness to do it, which is an experience that I really enjoy. And there's an element of uncertainty about it. There's always a leap involved. I never know if it's going to work, I have a suspicion. I hope it's going to work. And I think, I think to myself, well, I know this could work and this could work and this could work, but I never really know. There's always an element of leap in it. And what comes back, you know, we'll see. It's, it's funny. You read a script. Sometimes you read a script and you think, well, this is really good. And look at all these great people are in it. All these other actors that I know, and they're great. And this should be great. And then you do it. And then it doesn't, it, something about it chemically does not gel the way that you wanted and vice versa you can have other things where you think gee i don't this doesn't auger well and then you get on there and you do it and somehow something uh, catches something you know you get lightning in a bottle to use a corny expression mm -hmm. something happens there's a chemical element to it that you can't really predict so i love that about it the fact that there's always an element of chance in it and you have to really focus your mind on it. Yeah. Um, voice acting is interesting because of its limitations. And I also like about voice acting that I'm a person who grew up never liking the way that I looked. I always thought I was not particularly prepossessing looking. So I felt much freer in front of a microphone where I could be different things than saddled with the way I look, which, you know, I can play different things, but I'm not likely to play certain things, you know? Uh, so, so whereas in the voice world, my range is much greater. I, I want to, I, I, this question came up because somebody in, uh, actually Jeff Holman, our very own, really wanted to know because he saw your resume in IMDb and he saw that you were playing these kind of older authority characters like judges. And he said, that seemed to be where on IMDb, where your career seemed to start. So he was wondering, like, is have you lo have you looked like this since you were in college? Um, did, you, <laughs> did, did you fit those roles? Um, well, no, not you know. exactly. Um, no, what I have, I, I've had a strange career. Um, and I'll tell you, I'll give you the short version of it. You know, I, I, I went to Yale Drum School, as, as Dan said, um, with the intention of becoming a so-called serious actor. And um, I started out, I got a, Right after drama school, I got a job at a theater out in Minnesota called the Guthrie Theater for a year. 
<clears throat> and then I got a job on Broadway and Amadeus, on Broadway and in a tour of Amadeus, which was a big Tony winning show of the 80s. And during that performance of Amadeus, during that time of doing Amadeus, which I was in for 16 months, I developed this unbelievably bad crippling stage fright. Absolutely mm. horrible crippling. And this, I'd, I'd already been an actor for a while. And it became so bad that I thought, Jesus, I made this horrible mistake. I don't like this. I really don't like mm. doing an eight show week. And it became, I, I thought I was, you know, I thought, what am I going to do? I, 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 you know, here I said to people, I want to be an actor. And people said, oh, it's very hard. You shouldn't do it. And I said, well, I'll show you. And now I got this Broadway gig and I, I totally miserable. I don't like it. And it's a great play. And it's a good, you know, it's a good opportunity. I have a lot of friends who would be thrilled to have a Broadway gig, but I don't, I don't, I don't like it at all. So when this run was over, I felt kind of bad and defeated. And, you know, I thought, Jesus, this is bad. And I happened to have an, ag an agent, uh, Harry Abrams, Abrams Artists, which has since become A3 Artists, but at the time it was Harry Abrams. And he had a lot of very big voiceover clients. And I knew about the voiceover world because my dad had been, my dad was a television producer and he had been good friends with a, a very famous announcer in back in the day, a guy called Kenneth Roberts who was the father of Tony Roberts, the actor, Tony Roberts. Anyway, uh, I knew that I knew about, uh, as we used to call it, uh, voiceover work and, you know, being an announcer in those days. And I said to Harry, listen, um, you know, I'd really like to try doing voiceovers. He said, well, it's a tough market to crack and they don't really want people with sonorous, nice voices. They want people with voices that, that cut through. I said, well, just give me a chance. So he did. And this was 1984 four or five, right out of the box, I got some really nice big accounts. I got Mercedes-Benz. I got MCI, which is a phone company that people don't remember anymore. I remember it. <laughs> uh, I got um, Conoco, which is an oil company. So I had some very big accounts. So at a young age, I was still a young guy and I was not married. I didn't have any you know big responsibilities. So as a young guy, I started to catch on in the voiceover world and um, I kind of got spoiled. I didn't want to drag my raw meat out into the cold rain and uh, subject myself to all the rejection of being, uh, um, you know, a regular actor again when I was a kind of a star in the voiceover world uh, and making, you know, a lot of money and all that, especially for a guy with no family and didn't have to worry about any of that stuff. So I really liked it. And um, I also got very, very fat. I weighed 400 pounds. I ate constantly and... Yeah, so it was not it was not an entirely healthy period, but it went on for about twenty years, where that's all I did was voice acting. And occasionally, there were some casting directors who liked me. Uh, Woody Allen's casting director, a wonderful casting director called Juliet Taylor, and some another guy, Howard Fewer. I was kind of a favorite of theirs, so they would just call me up. I wouldn't audition. They'd say, "Well, Woody has a psychiatrist. It's six days. You want to do it?" So I'd say, "Yeah, yeah, that's fun. I'd, I'd like to do that." But I didn't have this strong desire to be great at it. I just kind of, it was a sort of like a hobby of mine. I wanted to be good, but I was, I was busy enough doing voiceovers and I was the signature voice of a lot. Of, I was the signature voice of USA Network. I was the signature voice of Mercedes Benz. I was the signature voice of the Super Bowl. I was the signature voice. Signature, and those days people had, uh, there was such a thing as signature voices, CBS Sports, NBC News. I had all these big accounts. So uh, I didn't do any real acting except for an occasional movie that would come along for a long time. And then the last really big account I had was CBS Sports, and I was the voice of the Olympics and the Super Bowl and all that stuff. And then a new regime came into CBS. This was about 2002, I guess, three. I don't remember. 2003, maybe. And they changed everything at CBS. They changed the graphics package, they changed the music, and they changed me. Now, at the time, there was this big kind of sea change in the voiceover world, and they didn't want people with deep, dramatic voices like mine, like James Earl Jonesy voices. They wanted real-sounding voices all of a sudden. <laughs> and I haven't sounded like a real person since I'm about eight or nine years old. <laughs> right. So I was like, and I had been a, I had been a visible enough a player that I was all of a sudden kind of like part of that, those kind of people we don't want anymore. I was part of that old crew of guys. Um, so my success, while I was grateful for it, kind of worked against me because I was part of the old guard. Mm. 
Mm. And by this time I had two kids and I was married and I had a house in Montauk and a house in New York and a lot of, you know, responsibilities and all that. And all of a sudden, you know, instead of making seven, eight hundred thousand dollars a year, I was making twelve thousand dollars a year, six thousand dollars a year. This went on for a few years. Uh, and you know, we had some money uh, saved and, but you know, with kids and houses and all that, it gets used fast. And, uh, so I was, things got kind of dire and I was sitting there, uh, a friend of mine had said to me, look, you have enough money for like one year before you have to like sell your house and make some really serious changes. What would you like to do? And I said, well, if I didn't have to worry about it, I'd like to go back to acting and writing like I did when I started. But I mean, it's so, it's such a crapshoot, you know? And he said, well, why don't you try? So I did to no huge success. Initially I was on, you know, uh, uh, Law and Order SVU, like every other person who's ever done a, a demonstration of a food processor at Bloomingdale's, you know, has been on Law and Order. But not as a dead body. <laughs> I was not a dead body. <laughs> Too fat to be a dead body. Nobody could lift me. So um, I did that and, you know, little things like that. And then one day I was sitting there with my wife in Montauk and the phone rang and she, my wife answered it and she said, do you know somebody called Joel Cohen? This is 2000 and seven one of the brothers yes so it was joel cohen and i knew them a little bit because i had gone to drama school with Fran Mac francis mcdormand and john torturo and a bunch of other people from and i knew john goodman people their you know retinue of people and i had auditioned for barton fink for the movie barton fink although i didn't get the part but they remembered me so joel cohen said listen we're doing this movie uh there's a part in it i just have a feeling you'd be really good in this part are you interested i was like well, let me check my book. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so I went to New York and I met with them and they said, well, we definitely want you to do it. We're not going to audition anybody. We definitely want you to do it. But the problem is we don't know when we're going to get to it. We're working on a, three movies simultaneously. One of them is that this movie, A Serious Man. We're also doing uh, Burn After Reading. And I don't remember what the other movie was. They said, but we have to do, Burn After Reading is kind of a, uh, a star-studded movie. It has George Clooney and Brad Pitt, and we have to do it based on the availability of these people. So we didn't make a serious man, and a year passed. <laughs> and I thought, oh shit, this is one of those things that happens in show business, where it's a great part, it's a great script, and it's going to just fall apart, as frequently happens. So um, then, after like 16 months, they called, and we made it. And then I had to another, wait another year for it to come out because it takes that long to post a movie. But when it finally did come out, it was nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars. I was shortlisted for an Oscar. I won an Independent Spirit Award for it. And all of a sudden, at the age of 52 or whatever I was, uh, I suddenly had this second act of my career, something I never in a million years would have um, bet on. Yeah. So I was extremely lucky that it, that it all came out that way. But I had a long period when I did nothing but voice acting. Well, I'm glad you told that story because somebody yeah. else would, really wanted to know where the voiceover came along. So I'm glad yeah, we got to yeah, hear that too. I'm not sure you're doing. Well, Fred, it has been fabulous having you back on the show. And those are fascinating stories to, you know, really, they, they really do tell people what, it, what this business is all about. And we really appreciate you bringing your, your expertise and, uh, and experience to us. Uh, so people can know what to think about. So I really appreciate you coming on. Are we at, at the end? I want to just say one one more thing, if please, I can. Go for it, to. please do. Okay. So I heard I was listening. I heard this great description um, about show business to learn how show business works. Um, it was from um, oh god, the guy who played Doogie Howser. Oh uh, uh, yeah, Neil so, Patrick three Harris. Names. Daniel Neil Patrick Harris. Yeah, so Neil Patrick Harris was being interviewed, and he said when he first got that job of playing Doogie Howser. Um, Neil Bochco, who did that show, sat him and his parents down, took him out to lunch and said, I want to explain to you how this business kind of works. He said, it's like surfing. You paddle out there, you wait, you wait, you wait for a wave, and then you don't catch a wave. And you see these other people catch this wave and they ride it in and everybody says, yay, and it's great. <laughs> and then you get a wave and you ride it in and it's fantastic and people are shouting and you love it and it's great. And then you're, of course, the wave ultimately crashes on the beach and then you have to paddle back out again <laughs> and wait <laughs> for a wave again. And maybe you get one and maybe it takes long and maybe it doesn't. And 
that's the way show business works. Yeah. So for everybody. So, you know, the message is if you have faith in yourself, which you must have in this business, don't give up hope. And also don't think that the good times last forever. Be prepared for everything because that's all part of it. Absolutely. Well, Fred, thanks so much for being here. It's great to see you again. And you too. Uh, and uh, eventually we'll all get together in person one of these days. So anyway, uh, thanks for being here. We really thanks, appreciate Fred. it. Great to, great to see you. All righty. All right. We'll be right back to wrap things up right after this. Hi, this is Bill Farmer and you are watching Voice Over Body Shop. It's great. <laughs> In these modern times, every business needs a website. When you need a website for your voice acting business, there's only one place to go. Like the name says, voiceactorwebsites.com. Their experience in this niche webmaster market gives them the ability to quickly and easily get you from concept to live online in a much shorter time. When you contact voiceactorwebsites.com, their team of experts and designers really get to know you and what your needs are. They work with you to highlight what you do. Then they create an easily navigable website for your potential clients to get the big picture of who you are and how your voice is the one for them. Plus, VoiceActorWebsites.com has other great resources like their practice script library and other resources to help your voiceover career flourish. Don't try it yourself. Go with the pros. VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. Well, it's time to talk about Source Elements again, the creators of Source Connect. Version, what are we on? 3.91 Source Connect Standard, the version that you should be using today and you've probably been using for at least five years now. That's how good this program is. It's been around that long or longer, actually. It's originally came out in its original form over 15 years ago. It is the tool that's being used now to produce the biggest budget commercial promo trailer and a lot of other projects as well remotely. And that's because it allows your voice to end up directly in the production. It inserts it straight into the track of that Pro Tool session or whatever system they're using at the other end so that it improves their workflow. It's a tool that makes productions flow. They're efficient. And when set up correctly, it even allows an engineer to record multiple voice actors all to their own tracks. And then when the session's over, the producer goes right to mixing. It's incredibly efficient. It works great. The sound quality is top notch. And you really should have it. So get yourself set up. Get the demo at the very least so you have an idea of the process of setting it up. There are quite a few steps. Um, if you really need a handhold, go to georgethe.tech slash SC and check out my guidance on Source Connect. But get it up and running and make sure you have it in your arsenal because it's going to allow you to take some of those bigger gigs. And you want to be able to say, I've got it, when the agent comes along saying, you need it. Anyway, this is a, a great, great product, and we really thank Source Elements for the support year after year. Okay, we'll be right back to wrap it up. This is Ariana Ratner, and you're listening to Voice Over Body Shop, VOBS.TV. And we are back to say goodbye. We're going to wrap it up and then re-rack it for Tech Talk, so stay tuned for that if you're watching live right now. Uh, next week... We'll have Tech Talk, number 51, by the way. And then the following week, March 1st, Mary Lynn Wistner will be here. Hey, Great. hey. I mean, the coach, she knows the business inside out, backwards and upside down. Great. Great. We've been wanting to get her back on for a while. Uh, not a lot of names on the donor list this week, but, you know, last week we had like 10,000. So <laughs> who do we got this week? Yeah, these names are all familiar. We've got Christopher Epperson, Christy Burns. And my old friend, Graham Spicer. So Alrighty. those are names we read all the time because they are subscribers. Uh, they probably opted to send in a little bit of money every month, which you can do. Or you can just make a one-time donation if you got some huge gold nugget from one of our guests or from Dan and I. It's up right. to you how you might want to support the show. But we really appreciate it. 
Yeah, if they didn't get a gold nugget from from Fred tonight, then they weren't listening. They weren't listening. <laughs> Some great stuff in there. Uh, we need to thank our sponsors, of course, Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials, VoiceOver Extra, Source Elements, VOHeroes.com, uh, VoiceActorWebsites.com, and, and JMC Demos. All righty. Also, Jeff Holman for dragging all those questions out of the uh, the chat room. Really appreciate nice it. Uh, and, uh, of course, our amazing technical director who pulls it off once again while not even being here, uh, Sue Merlino, thanks to her, and, of course, Lee Penny for being Lee Penny, and he knows who he is. Anyway, uh, we're going to re-rack it here, and uh, so stay tuned for Tech Talk. And uh, remember, you know, when it comes to your home voiceover studio, if it sounds good, it is good. I'm Dan Leonard. I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. B B S. S. Bye.